Hi everyone, Brian from Sui Generis Brewing here. It is quite early in the morning on Sunday, October 22nd, but I've made some malt. So obviously this is going to be quite important for my 50 meter brewing project because without malt, there's no beer. Uh, so what I've done with this particular batch of malt is I've taken the Harrington barley that I grew over the summer and I've malted it to make a base malt. Now this malt is been designed to be fairly similar to a malt you'd buy in the store, but maybe with a little bit more character to it. So I, I, I toasted it a little bit more than might be normal for a base malt. I still have the bare barley to malt, but there my goal is a little bit more of a character malt. So that malting process will be a little bit different. So I'm gonna be starting that probably next week. So the malting process I know is not something that a lot of people know a ton about, so I thought I would actually go through in some detail how it is that I made this batch of base malt. The malting process I use is fairly straightforward. There are much more complex uh, processes that you can follow. Some of them are more historical, some of them are more modern. This sort of straddles the middle ground and it's a, an easy method to do at home. And it does produce, at least in my test batches, pretty good batches of malt. So the very first step is we need to clean our malt. Now, when we did the actual growing and drying of the grain, we of course got rid of as much of the chaff as we could, but there's still a lot of dust, there's some residual chaff, and there will be underdeveloped kernels of grain in there as well. So to get rid of those, we simply rinse it with cold tap water. So I fill the bucket with water, stir the grain around. Uh, most of the chaff, as well as any underdeveloped kernels, will float to the top so I can scrape those off. And I then pour out the water, and I keep repeating this until the water runs relatively clear. And at this point, I know I have nice clean barley. The second step in the process is to soak the barley until you get to the desired moisture level. Now, in my last video, I went over how you determine the dry weight of your barley. And using that number, you can now determine how much water it is you need to add in order to get to your desired uh, pre-germination uh, water content. And maybe as a quick reminder, if you're on the lower end, high 30s to low 40% moisture, you'll end up with something like a Pilsner Walt because the malt will basically run out of water partway through the germination process, leaving it under modified. If you're in the low to mid 40s, you will end up with a pale ale malt. And if you press over 45%, you'll get something more like a Munich malt. So obviously one of the more important parts of this uh, soaking process is to know how much moisture you've added to your grain. And the way I've done this is fairly simple. Before I started soaking things, I pre-measured out a portion of grain. I know how much it weighs and I was able to calculate how much it should weigh once it's accumulated the desired amount of moisture. I can then put that into a hot bag so that I can soak it with the rest of the barley but keep it separate. And anytime I want to check the moisture level, I just pull that bag out, push the grain out onto the scale and see how much it weighs. And that allows me both to calculate the percent hydration at that particular point in time, but I also know how much that grain should weigh when I hit my desired level. And so I can keep an eye out for hitting that, that desired moisture level. Now this uh, soaking process is fairly simple and straightforward. You start by adding a little bit of metabisulfite to your water to neutralize the chlorine because you will get the same chloral amine flavors uh, from malting in tap water as you would if you brew with tap water. So we gotta get rid of that chlorine by adding metabisulfite. Now the soaking process itself can be as simple as just dumping the grain into water and leaving it there until you hit the desired level, but it's actually quicker to malt by having air rest. And so what that means is you soak for eight to 12 hours, then you pull the bag out give it exposure to oxygen for about the same amount of time, eight to 12 hours, and then soaking it again, and just repeating that cycle until you hit the desired water content. Now in my case, I actually needed five soaks to get from the roughly 6% moisture in my starting grain to my desired 45, 46% moisture in the uh, moisturized grain, which surprised me, my test didn't take that many soaks, but I've also never had barley this dry before, and I gotta wonder if that high level of dryness slowed water uptake. Nonetheless, I did hit it in about four days after these five soaks, uh, with air rest, of course, between each one, at which point it's time to start germinating. And germinating is pretty simple and straightforward. You spread the malt out. Uh, I have it in a bin on a concrete floor in my basement where it'll hopefully stay cool. You typically want this 12 degrees or so uh, Celsius, uh, mostly to prevent lactobacillus from growing. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and then several times a day, you just wanna turn that grain. And what you're trying to do by turning that grain is dissipate any carbon dioxide that's being respired by the grain as it germinates. 
You're also dispersing any heat that forms because this can get quite warm. And on top of all of that, you of course are evening out any moisture. If moisture sinks to the bottom, you'll mix it back in. I don't show it in any of the videos, but I have a fan running in the room to keep the air circulating in order to help keep that grain cool and to push away carbon dioxide as it's formed. But even so, near the end, the grain did heat up higher than I would have preferred. Uh, another part of that problem was I had plugged the furnace vent in the ceiling with a towel that fell out. Uh, so the furnace started heating the room again. Uh, but unfortunately, in the last day or so of the malting process, I ended up uh, getting some lactobacillus growth. And there's not much you can do about that other than sort of rinse it off before you start killing. But I might end up with a little bit of sort of a, a sour malt characteristic in my resulting beer, but that's okay. I mean, this is a, an exploration of sort of local ingredients and, and those lactobacilli, I guess, would be part of the local ingredients. So because the germination bed got warmer than expected, germination also proceeded faster than I had uh, thought it would. And unfortunately, that uh, towel dropped out of the furnace vent at the worst possible time. Uh, on Thursday uh, afternoon, I, or sorry, on Friday morning, uh, so two days ago, I checked the grain and we were very nearly there. Uh, the acrospires, which is the forming um, stem of the barley plant, on most of the grains was about halfway down the length of the grain and you typically want it closer to three quarters of the way down the grain. And there's a, a better way to look at how done the barley is. It's something called a smear test where you basically crush a grain between your finger and you smear the starch uh, across your fingers. And if the conversion is complete, it'll be a very smooth and even paste. Whereas if the conversion is ongoing, it'll be a little bit more crumbly and hell have a tendency to ball up. And so, you know, my crush test showed that about half of the grains were there, about half the grains weren't, and the acrospires kind of revealed that too. So I came home Friday night after work, and the temperature had jumped up from about the 12 to 13 degrees to almost 20 degrees Celsius, and uh, every single grain had an exposed acrospire, or almost every grain had an exposed acrospire, so we'd gone from 50% to over 100% the length of the grain. Uh, I had that horrible lactic acid growth, and definitely every grain uh, more than passed that smear test. So we actually probably went a little bit farther than planned, uh, but you know, that's the nature of home malting. You don't have the same level of control they do in a malt house and you don't have someone sitting around watching it all day. You know, some of us have jobs and go to work and whatnot. And that of course gets in the way of our hobbies, I suppose, some of the time. Nonetheless, at this point, I had some barley that I was ready to start killing. So the killing process has a couple of different goals to it. One is you are trying to stop the germination process. The second is you are trying to sort of dry out the enzymes in a way that allows them to become reactivated when you, again, re-moisten the grain. And we're trying to also develop some flavor. So to start, I placed my grain into our food dehydrator, which just barely holds the amount of grain that I malted here. So I malted 2.3 kilos, and that's basically what fit into uh, my food dehydrator. That uh, dehydrator was then ran overnight, so about 12 hours at 35 degrees Celsius in order to try and dry the grain below 25% moisture. Uh, the goal here being to stop germination and to start locking up those enzymes in a way that preserves their activity. If you heat the grain too quick, too early, those proteins will actually denature and stop functioning. But if you can bring the moisture level down low enough, they'll sort of get locked back up in that starch matrix and that'll then actually protect them from additional heating. So that happened overnight. That morning I wasn't quite as dry as I had wanted it to, but I was getting close. So I pushed to the higher end of that temperature range where you can do that initial drying at. Uh, I went up to about 38 degrees Celsius and that in the next three hours, so 15 hours overall, got the grain down to I think about 20 to 21% moisture. I then raised the temperature to 48 degrees Celsius to complete that drying process. That took about five and a half, sorry, six hours. Uh, and that got me down below 10% moisture. And at that point, those enzymes in the malt are relatively stable. As a general rule, malt is stable below about 13% moisture with 10% or lower being the ideal range. At that point, I was now ready to move on to adding flavor to the malt. And this is done by essentially giving it a light toasting. Now for this, I had to put it on pans and place it into the oven because my food hydrator doesn't go up that hot and I did three and a half hours at about 88 degrees Celsius. 
I'm actually a little worried I might have overdone this. Uh, in a few days, I will run a conversion test to make sure I didn't completely kill my malt. Uh, but it did give it a pretty nice toasty flavor. So I think if it still can self-convert, I've probably made a pretty good grain here. Uh, if it doesn't self-convert, I may have to add in some commercial malt when I brew my beer in order to make sure that everything converts as it should. So that's how I made uh, this batch of malt here. I'll try and add a, a close-up of the final product, but uh, it looks really nice. It has maybe a little bit of a gray hue to it compared to normal malt. I'm not too sure what caused that. Um, maybe that little bit of bacterial growth. So that's what I did with the Harrington malt, but I still have that bare barley that I also grew over the summer. And for those of you who maybe haven't seen my earlier videos, bear is around a 1200 year old strain of barley that still exists in its original state. It's one of the only, if not the only crop that we still have in its original form from the medieval period. Uh, so I was quite excited to grow that. It has a reputation for being a very flavorful malt. It's also got a reputation for not having an awful lot of convertible starch in it. Uh, so rather than trying to turn it into a base malt, I'm instead going to try and turn it into a character malt. And it has sort of, again, a reputation for having a very grainy and, you know, if you uh, sort of toast it a little bit, it really brings out some of these sort of toasty flavors. And so I sort of want to emphasize that when I malt it. And I haven't decided exactly on my approach for that yet, but I think I'm going to aim for something kind of like a brew malt or a honey malt. Uh, the way that works is I essentially malt it to make somewhat of a Munich malt but then I go through sort of a hotter, steamier toasting process at the end to develop some melanoidin flavors, which are where the proteins in the malt react with the sugars to form uh, Maillard products, as well as to develop some additional toasty flavor. And I'm hoping that'll really bring out that unique flavor of that malt and give my beer uh, an interesting character that maybe wouldn't exist uh, when you use more, uh, more commercial malts. So that I'm probably going to start next weekend uh, with the goal of then killing the weekend after. Uh, but we'll see how my schedule works out. It might take a little bit longer. This means we're almost at the end of this project. It is almost time to brew beer. But there is one minor hiccup in all of this. And that is that I have to wait at least two to three weeks after the next batch of malt is done before I can brew. And the reason for that is that freshly malted grain does have some harsh flavors to it, which needs some time to dissipate. And that takes two to three weeks. As far as I know, there's nothing you can really do to speed that up. I have made the mistake in the past in some of my test batches of brewing with it right away, and you notice that flavor. It dominates the beer. Uh, so probably won't be brewing until early December, uh, but I will have a quick update when I finish malting the bear barley to let you know how that went. And a few weeks after that, we'll have a brew day. So thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm hoping you're enjoying this project still. I know I am. And we'll see you in a few weeks when I put up the next video. Bye.